All right. Hey, how are you guys doing today? Uh, this is Charles. Welcome to Eternally Bored, the board gaming podcast where we go ahead and tackle the issues head on. Uh, I'm back again with our my co-host, Trey Chambers. Hi, guys. And we have a special guest here, uh, Ben Miller. Glad to be here. Uh, bringing in the, the day. And today's subject, Trey, what, what did we decide we were going to talk about? Brick and mortar versus online game stores. Um, and also, we're going to give our top three ways that we think friendly local game stores can compete in this modern world of Amazon, cool stuff, all those online game stores that undercut their prices <laughs> significantly. Um, and then uh, we're also going to talk about some new games that we've played. So, um, before we get started though, let's uh, introduce ourselves. So, I'm Trey Chambers, I'm a game fan and game designer. Um, I publish games with Level 99 and an upcoming game from TMG called Harvest. Um, Charles? It's currently just a frustrated Gwent player trying to get the level <laughs> 4,000, slowly but surely. But I also play board games and host a weekly board gaming group. And Ben? Uh, so uh, my name is Ben Miller. I am a uh, graduate student. Uh, I'm studying counseling. Uh, what's my place in the group? I know, it's ironic. Uh, I, can, uh, I can be classified as probably the most critical gamer in the group. Um, I, uh, you would agree with that, I would say? Could be yeah, classified. Yeah. I mean, so, Keith is giving you a run for your money, but... I mean, I would say, you know, I really love board games, so because of that, uh, I want them to be the best they can be. You know, it's like when you have that coach who's really tough on you, He's just like, because I know you can do it. You know, that's that's me, but for board games. No. Um, a better example would be that teacher who always gives you a C- minus because you just don't try hard enough. <laughs> I was that teacher also. Uh, yes. That's a past <laughs> life, though. Um, uh, in terms of my qualifications, uh, I've been to many game stores. Uh, I, I own a collection of about 250 games, so uh, I've played, played a lot. And, uh, you know, I play pretty regularly. I'm part of Charles's group, so. You've dabbled in game design, too. I do, I dabble. I'm working on lots of designs right now, but nothing finished, so. Excellent. All right, well, let's dive right in. So our topic today, brick and mortar versus online game stores. And I'd like to start off with talking about the pros and cons of friendly local game stores. So um, we'll start with the pros. Why should we go to a brick and mortar game store? What are some things they offer? <sighs> Probably the best thing that a, a brick and mortar game store is going to offer. And it's going to change as you get older. But when you're younger, the first thing I remember is just get, having that first sense of real community and different people. It sort of like opens your mind up to a number of different mm -hmm. uh, players and experiences that you're not really going through before. I mean, you get some exposure at school, but you might meet someone. Like I met people at my local game store when I was younger who went to my school and I had no idea that they were even close to being in in the hobby. So, so it's really like a community connection. Yeah, community connection yeah. is definitely uh, one of the top experiences. Yeah. And a physical place to actually play games. Uh, if you don't have a public meetup at a restaurant or some, like cafe or something like that, um, I, I know we used to meet at a uh, friendly level game store until it became not so friendly. Um, <laughs> which is, <laughs> which is uh, uh, something we'll get into a little bit later. But, um, but yeah, they can be good places to play board games if you can't find another venue. So physical space, um, a pro that I would say is the immediacy of like walking into a store and walking out with your game. I mean, even with Amazon Prime shipping, you gotta wait 48 hours and sometimes there's a game you really want to play mm -hmm. and the game day could be that night or the next day and even with prime shipping unless you overnight it you're not gonna have the game so if the friend local game store happens to have it you can immediately have it and immediately play it yeah and I, I particularly like uh, game stores because they have the advantage that a lot of uh, physical stores have which is the idea of browsing right if I go online I can't really look at stuff I'm making scroll down the new releases but like I don't know it's not the same as holding that box in your hand and looking at it and like Ooh, this yeah. game looks super fun flipping it over, seeing all the components laid out. Um, it's actually probably faster to browse the shelves in the uh, front of the game store than it is to go on even BGG and looking up games one at a time. That's true. It's just much more viscerally satisfying. Yeah. And um, uh, one other thing that you rarely see it in game stores nowadays, at least not in the areas I'm in, uh, but 
a number of the older game stores used to actually have demos of games. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, and that's something that's, that's very unique, the chance to try something before you buy it. I mean, that's something that you really can't uh, experience anywhere else except in game groups. So. Yeah, that's true. Um, any other pros that we can think of? No, there's so many cons to go through. <laughs> <laughs> it just goes on um, and on and on. So. Oh, I, wait, wait. Let me give you one more pro. Because most, okay. um, most of them do go into other nerdy things. Comics, um in the comics but uh, collectible card games yes which is magic figurines you some know. of them sell sell t-shirts for nerdy shows and things like that like so there's just in most of these are not dedicated game stores especially in america they usually sell like other random nerdy things and if you're into board games you're probably a nerd and there's other stuff for you to buy there yeah so i don't share that other overlap so for me i'm just rather than do only board games but uh yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Is, for some people, that would be a problem. Like, why are you wasting all the shelf space with all the other crap? I mean. <laughs> yeah, and I guess moving into the pros and the cons is, you know, since I brought it up initially, is the collectible card games. And unfortunately, you know, for a lot of board gamers, uh, the best CCGs are going to be a con. Uh, because, you know, they take up so much space whenever they run their tournaments, space whenever they do their release parties um there they will literally push you out and unfortunately yeah. for the survivability of the game store they have to have those ccg yeah. games push you out you know mm -hmm. uh, i don't know i've been to some game stores that had some regular board gaming events but every time there was a release party the board gaming event that was the first thing to go and the, the yeah. release party got inserted right in right one of the reasons we left the friend local game store we used to game in was because just we wanted to game on saturday night because that's when people are free and have free time it's and game time, yeah. that's also when they would do their magic tournaments and they used to let us play in a different room which was quiet and perfect for board gaming and then at some point they decided they didn't want us in there and so we were like mixed in with the magic people and it was loud and it was crowded and um, we weren't pulling in the money that they were. So of course they were going to accommodate the magic players. Magic so player. it was just not a great situation. Hey man, 15, 15 yeah. to $25 a person who's entering a tournament is hard for. Look, I mean, I understand it from an economic perspective, right? The stores, they have to make money, but it's just, they're not game stores anymore. They're magic stores. Yeah. But we'll, when we get to our top three ways they can yeah. save themselves, then and, and we'll moving, talk about that. Moving down the list of associated cons mm -hmm. of the pure game store is, uh, <laughs> and this sort of goes with the magic too, and I don't mean to be too bad, but uh, the people involved might not be the greatest when you're dealing with a mixed nerd crowd. Uh, you know, I specifically try to think about, you know, we, we had a few episodes about women in gaming and how uncomfortable the majority of game stores that I grew up yeah. in were for women. Mm -hmm. I believe that's changed a bit lately, but, you know, something that I've always thought about and brought into, you know, the reason why our group is located where it is. Yeah. I mean, it's hard for us to say, for me to say, because I think as three non-women, we don't really, you know, experience that necessarily. Um, but I, I think we've all witnessed things that maybe made us feel somewhat uncomfortable, and then you know, we can imagine how that would translate to someone who is a woman. Yeah. Oh, I've corrected people. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm also of the yeah. position and stature to be able to do that pretty easily. And, <laughs> I mean, just kind of, uh, it kind of segues into my biggest con for the friend local game store is that it's almost an ironic title because game stores have been some of the most unfriendly environments, even to me. Um, and, you know, it's just, why would I bother going into a store that's going to treat their customers rudely um and this is like multiple game stores that this has happened at um so it's it's and you know you can listen to other podcasts you can read other articles about friendly local game stores this is um like an epidemic so it's like why why so another con that we don't really need to talk about because it's obvious is they they charge full msrp most of these stores unless you have a paid membership but then you're still paying extra for that membership but so the price is, is upcharged, 
and then we're gonna go in there and you're gonna treat your customers weirdly or ignore them or all the stuff. I mean, just the, the people, for whatever reason, the people they hire to staff these stores and even some of the owners just have no customer service whatsoever. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of truth to what you're saying. I mean, I think we can look at a game store just like uh, any kind of store, right? The store has to offer something that is valuable, right? It has to have reasonable prices for the thing it's charging, and it has to provide good service. If it doesn't, it's not going to survive. I mean, if I went to a department store and everything was super expensive and people were rude to me there, I wouldn't go back to that department store. Yeah. How am I going to act any different just because they have games? Yeah, exactly. And uh, one thing I've noticed lately is that... Uh, you know, depending upon what game store you go to, um, variable amount of space is sort of what you, you mentioned earlier, how mm -hmm. you had game stores that uh, sort of decrease your gaming space. I've been to a lot of stores lately that had no space whatsoever for gaming. Not even, yeah. <laughs> oh, have they reduced their gaming space at, at Nance? What well, gaming space? You just can't actually play a game <laughs> oh, or mean, a demo or just a right, right, place right. to sit down and... Uh, I was like, because last time I was at Nans, it was many years ago, because um, I've, I've totally sworn off from the local gaming stores because of my experience, first with the gaming store we used to play at, where the owner physically fought someone in the store and the cops had to yeah. get called and ticket, store. and ticket both of them. Um, I mean, the guy was definitely being belligerent. He basically stood up. Um, and was like cursing the guy out because they had like some disagreement over magic cars over an email thing and so the guy was physically in a store and he recognized them and he told him to leave and the guy was like I'll leave when I finish my drink and this <laughs> and it was like a shouting match for a few minutes and then finally the guy gets up and pours a drink out on the ground um, at that point the owner uh, physically assaulted him and it, and it just ended up being a big fist fight and they both had bloody faces afterwards and it was just craziness and the cop got called and obviously the guy was being super belligerent but yeah i don't understand what's the problem with that story as, as the owner of the store he should have called the police and had the police take care of it not take you know law into his own hands like he's batman or something um i'm sure in his, in his own mind he was to be fair um, if batman ran a game store totally good <laughs> true fact um so anyway uh yeah so we stopped gaming there um and because we were it, this was a long time coming though because we it was the same store we got pushed in with the magic kids and the owner was constantly rude to us and just was an unfriendly person in general so we moved to restaurants after that and that group has been going strong it's actually grown significantly since then mm -hmm. um, because probably a lot of people who are uncomfortable going to his store are more comfortable in a restaurant environment uh, and then so that was strike one I, I stopped going to that store because of that and then the other big game store in Houston, which probably has the largest selection, is called Nans or Nans. Is it Nans? Or it's Nans. 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 So there's no delicious Indian bread there. Yeah, no, we don't. We don't well. actually have any dedicated game stores in Houston. And Nans had the biggest board game selection, and basically it was like half the store. And it's a decent sized store, so they had a really good board game selection. So I used to go there all the time. Um, I didn't buy a lot of big box games there because you know, a $20 difference in price is significant. But I would buy lots of card games there because then you're only playing like a couple bucks more and I immediately had it in my hands. I bought tons of uh, sleeves from that store. And, you know, I liked going there and it was conveniently located and everything. And then one day, I, w I went there on a Sunday and I arrived five minutes before closing time and I really needed to pick up some sleeves because we were playing a social deduction game that night and I wanted to sleeve the cards because you can't, you know, play social deduction games if the cards get marked. So I, I'm there five minutes before closing, and the door's locked. I see the person working there. I knock on the door. The guy walks up to the door, and I said, hey, I just need to pick up some sleeves, and it's five minutes before closing. Can I buy them real quick? And he just shakes his head no and walked away. <laughs> and that was the last time I have walked into a friendly local game store, because I was like, not only did they close early, not only did the guy see me and acknowledge my presence, he just shook his head no and walked away. Because, you know, why would you actually want to buy things at a store? I mean, um, I think clearly you're the one with all here. Why would you want to sell things to your customers? I mean, maybe you had a hot date that night. Or... You know, if a woman can't wait five else. minutes, it's not worth it. That's all I can say. Oh, I didn't say it was with a woman. But, <laughs> so what has been some of your experiences at the game store has been? Okay, um, well, I, uh, I uh, started gaming about six years ago uh, in Austin. And it was, uh, it was a beautiful time, beautiful time for me. We used to go to a game store called Great Hall Games. It was like uh, half designer games and half like game accessory. They have like dice and some mass market stuff. It was a great store. Uh, they, we 
do Friday, Friday night gaming there and Saturday gaming, and, and it was just always open when you needed it. It had a pretty good selection. I was too poor to buy games there at the time because I was an undergraduate student. That was a great store. Apparently, since I've been gone, they moved to a different location, and then they stopped. People stopped coming there, and then they closed. So that's kind of sad. But there's actually quite a few good game stores in Austin. Uh, we were, I was recently there on a trip with my fiance, uh, and we went to this gaming cafe that was called Emerald, Emerald Tavern Games and Cafe, and it was super cool. It was like mostly a game store, but then they sold like sandwiches and like some fancy coffee drinks, and alcohol as well. Uh, there might be alcohol too. I don't know. If, yeah. I don't know if they had that, but um, the future probably. <laughs> and they had this giant shelf of demo copies. It was, like, amazing, all these different copies. I was like, oh, this is super cool. People there, eh, they weren't super friendly, but, you know, it doesn't usually bother me. I don't give a shit. Well, you so know, you always have the, the cult of the game store to sort of That's true. combat against. Uh, my own personal experience is a little bit different. Uh, I both went worked in the game store. My first job, I worked there for six years. Oh. And uh, it was mostly a comic book. It's a mixture of a bunch of different things, but they had the pay for system. Uh, if you had a subscription, either a baseball card or a game subscription, or an RPG game subscription, if you had any of the subscriptions, you got a percentage off. I believe like twenty percent off yeah. MSRP, and it was good against good for everything in the store. Uh, so it was um, it was a pretty interesting, but they had no space to really game at all. Mm. Um, actually didn't prefer it and later on um, I went to stores uh, in like the hero clicks genre which is the same as the collectible card games and then moved to Houston and overall uh, you know my, my biggest thing with the games stores that I've been to is that uh, you got to be more welcoming uh, <laughs> I do I do want to build on something with Trace said before because you said that there were no good game stores in Houston and that's not strictly true actually I've been around trying to find some some game stores, and if you go far enough north, you can find them. <laughs> oh, um, Eden Games is out there. Yeah, yeah. I haven't been to Eden, but I have been to the Gaming Goat, which is a pretty good store. It's very small space, but there's some space to play, and they're pretty yeah. friendly there. And uh, last Memorial Day, I went to uh, Dragon's Lair, which opened up really recently. Super nice store, lots of game space, couple tables to play on. They have weekly events. It was super clean and new, and it was next to a delicious Indian fast food restaurant, so that does sound like a cool place. And, As, really cool and place. Asgard is pretty good in, in the yeah. city. But Asgard's okay, there's a lot of magic there. Not much of a selection. A lot of Warhammer yeah. there, too. Yeah, that's also true. And magic yeah. games. Fifth Dimension uh, is actually owned by a friend of mine's husband and mm -hmm. is a really cool store. Not a huge selection, but they have they have one really gigantic shelf of games, so but it's mm -hmm. not a and they do have some game space in the back. And we actually did a like proto um, con a little mini con in mm -hmm. that store where people could come and show off their prototypes. So it was pretty neat. So like there there definitely are good game stores, but I wouldn't say there's great game stores except but I haven't been to the ones that Ben mentioned. Yeah. So maybe those well, are Well they're great. few and far between. You gotta drive up to Conroe, so it's like a thirty yeah. minute drive. Uh, that's Conroe drive. is like a forty five to an hour drive for me. So, it's far. Yeah. It's far. But if you're up there it's a great place to be. Yeah. So there's would a, you have any suggestions if you were gonna open up a game store or gaming cafe, anything that you would do that would, uh, you know, sort of build to make well, a good uh, gaming store? Before, well, we I have the top three. You do um, have top three. Okay. Yeah, so, so we should save that for that portion. Yeah, <laughs> but let's let's move on to online stores. So what do online stores offer? What are the pros of them? I love online stores. <laughs> See, I'm a major market man myself. That's not as popular. People like uh, cool stuff. I'm a cool stuff guy. Yeah. Yes, uh, cool stuff is great. Major Mark has slightly lower prices on some items. Uh, I've actually am also. Oh, I, I agree. I'm yeah. also uh, a Kickstarter guy, and a direct pre-order person. That's. I feel like that's a separate episode. <laughs> separate episode. We, 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 need need Kickstarter. Kickstarter. we definitely need to uh, have a Kickstarter episode. Yeah, but, yeah that could that could be on that one too. If you uh, want. So many Kickstarter stories. But uh, yeah, but yeah, I mean, but money. I mean, the prices in online stores are so much better. It's just like not even comparable. They're like twenty, mm -hmm. thirty bucks less than the MSRP. Right, and uh, our friend Eric actually is from the area where Cool Stuff is. Yeah. So he used to, his frontline game store was Cool Stuff, and he got <laughs> yeah. that at online game store prices. So, so jealous. So yeah, jealous. The, yeah, the jealousness is, is really... 
um, really big. Although some companies are starting to crack down and forcing even online stores to sell it in MSRP, so that's a bad trend, but yeah. also probably a separate episode. But Are we going to talk about the, <laughs> the, the creep of Asmodee? Oh, man. It's like the board. Too much, too much. JK, I love you guys. Publish my games. Um, I would also <laughs> say one, uh, one good thing that online stores have is a really good selection, right? Because there's like so many different games that they can offer that if you go to a store, there's limited by their shelf space. Online yeah. stores, they have warehouses that can provide a lot more stuff. Yeah. Sure. For browsing, game stores might be better, but for no, if you know what you want, mm -hmm. online game stores are better, usually in both selection and you know, just they have search engines, so you just type and then you don't have to sit there looking on a shelf trying to find the exact game you're looking for. And if I get time for that. Yeah. yeah. Plus, you know, we're all very internet savvy. I That's mean, true. They're, I feel like most know, gamers are, which yeah. is why well, listening to this. Game stores That's why I'm online games. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, there is something to be said about uh, being able to get that game you just played right now on an impulse buy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not really that type of purchaser, but I know yeah. a lot of people are. Yeah. And, you know, Amazon exists for that poison. Mm -hmm. And so do these... Uh, yeah. From what I've noticed, almost all the online gaming stores actually are uh, also have shadow deals with Amazon directly. So uh, yeah. and Tang and a few others. So they're doing business underneath a number of different fronts in order to get you the game as a approved vendor. So you yeah. know. So what about uh, cons? Cons yeah. for online stores? Uh, no promos. They do not give you anything extra. No, Cool uh, Stuff does. I've gotten many promos from Cool Stuff. They'll just tape it to the box. Yeah. I have never awesome. in my life gotten a Cool wow. Stuff promo. That's amazing. <laughs> because <laughs> I, 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 I order like double the amount from you. I order Fair like 90% of my games from Cool Stuff. And so I usually order between four and five games. And usually one of them has a promo taped to it. Like most recently, Adrenaline. When I got Adrenaline, it had the promo card taped to it. Um, so that was helpful. That's so cool. thank you, Cool Stuff, for like randomly giving me promos for no reason. <laughs> no, I've ordered a few different places, and I, I rarely get uh, get promos from uh, them. Not like, uh, you know, the frontline game stores, they might get a shipment and every single box mm -hmm. will have a promo on it. Or, uh, you know, they generally, the, the savviest of the latest online stores that I've seen will have like the deluxe Kickstarter edition sort of available mm -hmm. to them as part of their initial order because they're sort of moving from a, a couple of different perspectives, yeah. uh, ordering from a couple of different companies. Uh, the ones that are fixed with just ordering from like one particular service vendor, they're not quite as good, but the ones who have broadened their ordering capabilities are, are very good. Yeah. For me, uh, I think the, the low prices are good, but there's a, a double side with that where you have to get to a certain threshold to get free shipping, right? So you have to order $100 worth of games to get free shipping for most online stores. I think that's true for cool stuff. I know it's definitely oh, yeah. true for the major market. Um, and the problem is, like, maybe I only want to buy one game, but then I have to buy it all at once, so that discourages me necessarily from buying stuff. Yeah. Whereas the store, I don't have to... Buy hundred bucks for the stuff. For one game, if you have Amazon Prime, though, you can get it with free shipping. Yeah, but you know, Amazon is yeah. slightly higher typically. That's true. Yeah. However, you know, I also consider that a pro <laughs> because uh, anything to pre prevent impulse buy. Not that I'm a big impulse buy, but I know a lot of people who are. I mean, if someone wants to buy one game, impulse next day, ship it. And uh, I mean, it's okay. I'll spend the extra thirty dollars. I only the store to to practice self control for me. I can handle it myself. <laughs> But it's also kind of, you know, right now I have this issue where uh, I finally did order stuff from Cool Stuff, and I ordered some games that are available right now, and some games that are pre-orders, and those games that are available right now are stuck with the pre-orders, so I'm like, I want to play this, but I have to wait for these yeah. darn pre-orders to come in. Oh, and one more um, con I would add is that um, the game stores sometimes will sell out before from local game stores, like if it's an obscure game, mm -hmm. but like gamers really want it, they'll go on and all the online stores will be sold out, but it'll be sitting in the corner of the the actual friendly local game store because they got their copy and no one went by and bought it because everybody jumped online and bought it. So like sometimes you'll find sold out, quote unquote sold out games in friendly local game stores. This so is not the case in Houston proper, but yes, in other places. Mm -hmm. no. I, um, I have heard it goes. And all right, so let's go through our top three real quick. Um, so um, everyone's number three ways that uh, friendly local game stores could compete, um, considering all the advantages that online stores offer. Um, did you do a top three, Charles? Do you have a three? Oh no, you can start with it. All right, so my number three, 
um, some of the things that Ben talked about in the stores that he liked, they um, they promote board games. Knowledge, they have knowledgeable staff that can demo games for you or recommend games for you. Um, they can even maybe teach them to you. Um, so game stores that have, uh, and I guess I should roll into that dedicated gaming space. Because one thing you definitely can't do in an online store is play the game, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you can actually, if they have gaming space, you can actually play the games that you purchase and then I think that's one way that they can definitely compete. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, in the Emerald Gaming Cafe that we went to, the wall of games was really cool, but I was like, I don't know how to play these games, and I don't know, these people are busy working work in the restaurant, I don't really want to ask them to, to teach me, so. Cool. Do you have a number three? Yes, my number three is be open long hours. Oh, please, yes. Yes, because when I go to gaming, I have to drive there, and it's time out of my day, and I want to make that time as valuable as possible, so I want to go there and then play for as long as they'll let me play. Right. I want them to have a four-hour gaming session so I can play two games. It's not worth my time. Exactly. That That is a huge one for me. Like I host gaming days at my house for that reason because most game meetups in public, whether they're in a comic book store or a restaurant or whatever, usually only last between five and eight hours. But I'm crazy. I like to game 12 hours or more. You know. So hmm. the, the longer hours you can be open and available for uh, gaming, the better. All right, my number two is real fast. Actually be friendly. I think enough said there because we already complained so much about their unfriendliness. Which... Number two, be food accessible. Yeah. If I'm going to spend a lot of time in a game store, I got to eat at some point. You either need to have some kind of food. I remember Great Hall used to sell individual slices mm -hmm. of pizza. Or uh, the one I was talking about before has a, a like a fast food Indian place next door. There's got to be some place to eat. Well, actually, one of the things that's really good is when game stores actually make food partnerships. Mm -hmm. That's something that uh, my game store used to do. Um, you know, where if you order from a particular place that was close or local in the mall, you got a discount yeah. and vice versa. And it was very easy to do for them because it's like, hey, 10% off and, you know, we'll bring it to you because you're cooking it next door. Yeah, that's and, awesome. And uh, it worked yeah. really well for that game store. Hmm. And that kind of rolls into my number one, which is offer something besides games sold at full MSRP. Like if, if your selling point can't just be the immediacy of, going up to the shelf and buying it. Like, you need something else to draw your uh, your fans in. So if you want to be a comic book slash magic store, then that'll probably be successful, and you can have your board games in the corner and occasionally sell some, and that's fine. Um, but it, it's not board games that'll keep you in business in that model. It's the comic books, or it's the comics, and especially the magic. But if you care about board games and you really want to have a game store, then basically you need to be a board game cafe slash bar. Um, because I think that model has some promise and it's been very successful in a lot of areas and I think that's the future like if you want a brick and mortar game store you need to offer food or uh, be a bar or something like that just offer people a place to play and a reason to come in besides paying more for your games than they would pay online mm. and yeah, my number one is kind of similar it's just have open gaming events uh, and, and that story went to up north Dragon's Lair they have like a weekly calendar where they have events every week. And you know what? That's what brings people in. And if I'm going to buy a game in a store, it's more likely if I keep going. That's how it works, right? If you keep looking at that game, like, well, I should get that. If you keep looking at it, even if you say, oh, I shouldn't get it, then eventually you're going to be like, I'm just going to get that game. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, my number one would be building loyalty, which is sort of mm -hmm. like a combination of what you've been uh, alluding to. Because if you have people who are loyal to you mm -hmm. and you can, you know, promise them that they'll have something in the reasonable period of time and you deliver then you know they'll keep coming to you and I I have seen that erode over over the years and that's the whole reason why online game stores have built up such such loyalty because they even when they don't have a copy of the game they're very good at following up with people mm -hmm. and letting them know when the game is coming in and building that brand lo loyalty that we used to have on the local level excellent I think it's been a great discussion. It went a little long, um, so no we'll, long. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll, we'll uh, kind of just give our hot takes on some new games um, that we've been playing. Uh, so first, uh, one that we both played was the and it's right there, the tenth anniversary edition of Notre Dame, one of Stefan Feld's first games, and one of his best because <laughs> his new games are bad. Um, <laughs> Uh, like that, hey, I'm the critical one. <laughs> the, the designer and the <laughs> And, uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a classic Euro game, and it's just, it's really good. It's really solid systems, very elegant, easy to teach, 
Um, just a very, very tight system. Um, not as much point salady as some of his newer games. And uh, it comes with the expansion built in, which offers a lot of replayability. So this is a mm -hmm. two to five player uh, medium weight game. Takes about an hour to 90 minutes at most. Very solid, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess you have nothing else to add. You agree with my assessment? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great game. Don't let the rats get too high, because they will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> good advice. Uh, Charles, did you play something good? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you play something bad? Yes. What you did you play that was game? bad? Uh, I played a game called Black Orchestra. Oh, yeah, you told me about that. So, um, <laughs> let's see. This is a game by Philip DuBerry, who's uh, the designer of uh, Revolution. Uh, another game that I thought was better than it was when I first played it. Uh, basically, Black Or Orchestra is a game that's covering uh, World War II, and the Black Orchestra is trying to assassinate Hitler by uh, sort of in a co-op co uh, card-drawing, dice-rolling capacity, mm -hmm. uh, moving around. Hitler and his lieutenants move around the board uh, in... Fury of Dracula fashion is what it felt like, uh, but it was a little bit more random than that. And you, as a group, were trying to uh, assassinate him. Um, so what are the problems with it? It actually sounds interesting. <sighs> yeah, well, I'm fine killing Hitler. <laughs> two things. From a thematic perspective, I don't think they went far enough. Uh, they had a lot of history on some of the people, but they didn't go into the full backstory of explaining all the events. Mm. Uh, the flavor text on the card didn't give gave a little bit of the flavor. It's, I could tell they researched the history, but they didn't put enough of it in the game. And I think when you're dealing with a period game that's actually educational and, and based on, could be educational and based on actual facts, mm -hmm. you should have some of that theory. There was nothing in the rule book. There wasn't really anything in the cards, nothing, you know, things that could really so remind you. Felt too abstract. Did it have any mechanical problem? Uh, mechanically, it was just, you are setting up these long series of events. Um, usually you have like one or two s shots to get Hitler. Uh, you have to randomly draw from a deck. Uh, you're rolling. You, you can either take three dice actions or you can roll for an event, and that could give you a random number of dice actions. In addition, it has a very classically bad game design of if you roll bad, you go to jail, so to speak. And if you go to jail, you basically lose your turn. That in addition, random. yeah, that does not sound fun. In addition, <laughs> you're trying to track down Hitler and his lieutenants, and they don't move in a pattern. They literally just warp to different places on the board. So you could, mm. and every you have three actions possibly. You could roll for more or less, and. You know, you can also get arrested at any time, and the cards might just, you could draw a card and immediately get arrested, go to jail, and lose your turn. What is this, being black in America? Yeah. <laughs> so, it was a terrible game. Go ahead. All right. Uh, All right. Ben, uh, I want to, so, can, how much time, can I talk about two games? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, speaking of horrible randomness, uh, the game I want to talk about first is called Albion's Legacy. Uh, which I guess is some kind of Arthurian word. It's kind of an Avalon theme, Arthur and Lancelot, and mm -hmm. I was the Lady of the Lake, so that was awesome. Uh, <laughs> the game is like a cooperative, it's fully cooperative, which is a thing they put in the box, because I guess cooperative's not enough to put. <laughs> and, fully cooperative. Yeah, that's right. And uh, what they, the game is basically is you have some dudes on the board and you're trying to accomplish a kind of mission, uh, which is mostly kill a bunch of guys, and then in the mission we have was bring tokens to these tiles we have to explore. So we are like exploring these different hex tiles, and then based on what you find in the tiles, it might bring out more threat, and then you have to fight that threat. The problem with the game is the way that you fight threat is uh, you have like different levels of skills, and then different threats can be fought with different skills, and the level of your skill tells you how many dice you can roll. Mm -hmm. And each die has a one-third chance of hitting, basically. And so most of the enemies have like three hits have to kill them, or four hits. And it's basically random. You have like a maybe 40% chance of killing it, and you have to constantly be killing these guys. And then when too many threats come out, they start to combo off each other, so then they all become like super strong, and you can't kill them. Yeah. It's just really random, and uh, someone in the game compared it to Eldritch Horror. I haven't played that game, but 
from what I understand, it has a similar level of highly random. Yeah. If you roll well, you do well. If you don't, you don't. Those are experience games. They're not meant to be. Yes. Well, I did not enjoy the experience. So that's my <laughs> that's my critical take for the day. Yeah. Um. Excellent. You, yeah. You liked the game this week? Okay, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. I gotta hear this. <laughs> oh right yeah, now. yeah. Let's hear. So yeah, uh, great game I played was called Emperor's Choice, uh, and this was uh, apparently it's only available on the BGG store for like sixty five bucks because it's Japanese. Oh. <laughs> but it was actually a super fun game. So it was uh, sort of a classical Euro design. It's uh, essentially at the beginning of the game, each round you bid for a row of tiles. There's like four to one row of tiles for each player, and you're bidding with these cards in your hand and also soldiers, which are like currency. And the clever part about the game is, uh, when you bid and you win the bid, you only lose one of the things you bid, based on what your position is. So if you win first place, drafting order, you win the high, most valuable thing you bid. If you win third place, you win the third most valuable thing you bid. So if you didn't bid three things, you won't lose anything at all. So that part's pretty clever. The other part that I thought was super interesting is uh, there's a track that is like the Emperor's Favor or whatever, and when you move up on that track, at the end of the turn, the two highest people on that track get to choose what gets scored that round. So there's different cards that score for different types of tiles. And uh, if you're up on that track, you can be like, oh, I'm going to score this thing, which I have a lot of, and other people maybe have less of. So that was a very clever mechanism. It was a really fun game. And I hope some American publisher picks it up so I yeah. can buy it. <laughs> if you're an American publisher, pick it up. It sounds interesting. Yeah, it's super good. I don't think anything's been picked up from the BGG store, though. I think all of those no, are. Um, Rolling think... America got picked up. Oh, really? Or Rolling Japan, which became Rolling America. Yeah. Yeah, there's been a couple. Not yeah. many, but a couple. Um, Trains was in a... I don't know if it was in the BG store, but it was in a, a Japanese game that was picked up and published in America. Oh, and actually, One Night Werewolf um, was a Japanese game, and I think yeah. it was sold in the BG store, went, the Japanese version, and then got picked up and brought here by Ted Altsbach. Altsbach, yeah, busy again. Was it actually yeah. sold? I've never seen it in the BG store. I mean, it might have been I, for, I, like, one... I think okay. it was. That sounds right. Okay. Um, okay, so I played a few more games. Uh, they were all good, so I have actually nothing critical to say this week. Uh, I played what Caverna... What that? Right. I played Caverna, Caverna K versus K, which is a two-player Caverna, essentially, but um, it's a little more complex, but uh, complex in some ways and simpler in others. It's um, it, They took out the farming. You're basically just building now, so you're mm -hmm. building out a cave, building rooms in a cave. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's very good. I don't think it's better than Agricola, All Creatures Big and Small, but it's close. And I think with some expansions, like, All Creatures Big and Small got, it could surpass it. Um... Corona never gets expansions, so it'll be worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, I played Hellas and Elysium, which is the, uh, Terraforming Mars, uh, mini expansion, which is essentially just a board with new goals, um, different milestones and different, um, scoring, in-game scoring. Uh, and I only played one side of it so far, and it didn't change the experience as much as I thought it would, but it was still good. It's something else to kind of mix it up, but... See, I sort of disagree with you. I think it changed it quite a bit. I thought it was exactly what it, it needed. And admittedly, you're still playing with the same cards, but because you have different awards and milestones, the strategy is... Yeah. yeah. Well, the strategy is different. It didn't feel different to play. No, it does not. Feel yeah, different. from my perspective, if it doesn't change the giant deck of random cards, I'm not interested. You can count me out for that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm much anticipating the first big expansion, which it, I believe is going to have new cards, and that one I'm excited about. I'm. An, I'm skeptical though because I think it's adding a sideboard of Venus, so you're also going to colonize Venus at the same time you're colonizing Mars and. That seems like maybe a bridge too far. <laughs> no, we'll it's, see. It's obviously the first step to colonizing the entire solar system. <laughs> just add eleven expansions. Yeah, but it's too and many. then you just have like a Eight twenty expansions. foot long table, and it'll just be the whole solar system. Okay, that we try. Yeah, but um, I, I've seen games it's called High Frontier. Yeah, but I do think it's it's a good, a very good expansion. I've seen games who, you know, have added a board and changed up their in game goals, and they completely ruined the game in the yeah. expansion so this yeah. is actually commendable in that it does not do that I still play on game just because something else to spice up Terraforming Mars it just didn't change the game as much as I kind of thought it would um, Sushi Go Party which is the ultimate light drafting game uh, Seven Wonders is dead to me now because if I'm playing a light drafting game Sushi Go Party is way easier to teach it doesn't have the confusing icons it doesn't have like crazy scoring like Seven Wonders um, it can play actually more people than Seven Wonders. I believe you can play eight outside the box. So um, 
yeah, it's just, I think it's superior to Seven Wonders in every way, in, in what Seven Wonders is doing, except the art. The art in Seven Wonders is quite good. So I don't think Seven Wonders is bad. It's an enjoyable game. I've played it many times, but I feel like I would never, for the, it occupies the same space as Sushi Go Party, and uh, I think Sushi Go Party kind of beats it in accessibility, time, and it does basically the same thing. But Trevor, just to clarify, how would you compare it to Seven Wonders? <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, I feel like it occupies the same space and does everything well, Seven Wonders does, but does it better. Okay. Is it well, going to be the same runtime? <laughs> is, it, is it the same runtime as Seven Wonders? It looked um, like it was shorter. Oh, was yeah, yeah. It's also shorter than yeah, Seven Wonders, so I another would, plus in yeah, its I, I haven't played that one. I've played regular Sushi Go. It's pretty light. Yeah. Yeah. It's regular good. Sushi Go is not nearly as good. Okay. Sushi Go Party yeah, yeah. Um, has uh, alternate scoring goals, so mm-hmm. every every game will be different, and it also it actually works like a deck builder. So you it comes with like twenty different decks, and each game you only play with like seven of them. Oh. So every game is gonna feel very different. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the last game I played was No Siesta, the No Lagranja, Siesta, uh, Granja, uh, dice game. Um, I don't really like dice games, but I think it was a very solid one. So. As far as dice game goes, I think it was very good, and I don't really have much else to say about it. It plays two to four people, lasts less than an hour, and uh, has decent replayability, and probably not great replayability, but, you know, I thought it was a good game, solid game. The best part about the game is you get to say, no siesta. (laughs) Yeah, I actually disagree. I think it's one of the better, um, you know, what is it, about 10 minute per player games Mm -hmm. that you can... uh, Put on the table, especially if it fits well in its time frame. It's easy. To, it's not easy to explain, but for uh, it's, it's one of the better dice games. What did you know? disagree with? That's exactly what I said. <laughs> I didn't disagree with anything. Oh, oh, I thought you said. I just I'm I just saying for people who, for people you know, I, I just like to to mention it's like I I don't think I feel like you uh, you know what. I'm just going to agree with you on it and keep on going to the end. I can't really get my thoughts together at the moment. <laughs> All right, well, if you're going to bring in five games, I'm going to go ahead and add more. All right. Oh, what you yeah. got? It's maybe my only time to guess, so I'm just going to say more stuff. <laughs> All right, uh, we, another game I played yesterday was a game called Slough Off. It's a trick-taking game. Uh, it's a pretty clever idea. It's a pretty standard trick-taking game. It's like a deck of uh, five different colors, 1 through 15. I think the four-player game plays 1 through 12, which is what we did. And the way it works is... You get your 15 card hand, and then you have to take tokens that represent what color of tricks you're going to take. So if you're like, I think I'm going to take two purple tricks and one green trick, then you take those three. And then whenever you get a trick that matches that color, you get rid of the token. The tokens are all worth negative points. Okay. If you ever take a trick that you didn't take a token for, you can get a black token that's worth negative three. So it's a really punishing game, because if you have a good hand, you have to really accurately guess what kind of tricks you're going to take. If you don't guess that, you're going to be really punished. And the clever part is that there's uh, one player who gets to be the sluffer. They get this plastic sheet, or it's like a chicken piece, which is kind of weird. <laughs> and they can take as many tricks as they want, and they're trying to get people to over take too many things because they get fewer points based on that. But it's a really weird game because the best score you can get in a round is zero. Everyone else, <laughs> you either, either lose points or you get zero. That's the game. Okay. But it's, it's pretty clever. And uh, we played with someone who's not a fan of trick-taking games, and he really liked it, so... How many players does it hold? It plays up to five. So okay. three to five, yeah. That was pretty oh, cool. Trick team game with variable playing counts are pretty rare, so that's that's interesting. Yeah. Another game we played was called uh, Pathogenesis. This is a deck building game that the theme is you are bacteria attacking the body. I saw this game. Okay. Yeah, so uh, it's like there's three different areas you can attack. You can attack the digestive system or the lungs or the skin. Mm-hmm. And so it's a pretty clever game. You have a ton of these uh, germs that are in your hand. You also have some like some action cards, and you can use them. They produce a kind of currency. Uh, it has kind of a cross between a Dominion style and Ascension style, where you can buy some upgrades for your germs, and then buy some upgrade your uh, like so you can buy some things that mutate your germs into different things, and then change your germs into other guys. So are the cards coming now in a line like Ascension, or are they already set out in decks like Dominion? So the, the upgrade the cards, the things that you can add on to your germs, mm-hmm. uh, come out in Ascension style. And then the way you upgrade the germs and the other germs is there's specific stacks for it. So it's kind of a cross between it. The really wonky part of the game is once you start attacking the body and getting points, you start getting the way you do is when you do damage, you get their little points from them. The body starts attacking back with its immune system. Makes sense. Yeah, and it's (laughs) kind of random because you draw these cards from the immune attack deck, and they can range from like two attack to ten attack. And a 10 attack, there is no germ you have that's going to survive that. 
or your thing might survive, and, you know, maybe he'll be around for another round. But mostly it's like they just get destroyed. No, you can let him in. I know how to video edit now. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Charles. We're gonna get... <laughs> Charles We're gonna first get... me to lo- forced me to learn how to video All right, edit. And the last game I'm going to talk about is a game called Magic Maze. Have y'all played Magic Maze? We have not played no, Magic Maze. I've heard Maze. about it, though. This game is a pretty clever idea. It's a cooperative game. We play with four. Everyone is in control of one direction. Mm-hmm. And what the you're band. Trying... What? The band. One direction. Yeah, that's right. You're in control of one direction <laughs> band. You're in control of a direction like north, south, east, or west. Okay. And so they're basically, you're trying to get these four dudes on this board to explore around to find specific locations. The theme is like, you're, they're trying to shoplift at a fantasy store and then run away. Okay. They're like fancy characters trying to shoplift goods. And so you're trying to get them to a specific location and then re- find their exits. But the thing is, you can only move the pieces in one direction. So I'm like, I'm in charge of north. I need to get around this place to get to this, this location. I need to go north. I need this guy to move west. But you can't talk in the game. So, okay. even though I need him to move west, I can't say anything to him. The only thing he can do is there's this big wooden piece, you whack it on the table in front of him, and then that is what, like, I'm telling him, you need to do something in the game. So okay. does this game have, like, a copious amount of table talk and cheating, like Kanabi, or, <laughs> no, so there's or, actually, or body gestures and image, body gestures? We did have some problems with body gestures, but there's actually points in the game where you can talk. So, there's, there's a, the game is timed on a 10 minute timer. Mm-hmm. Actually, I don't know how long the timer is. It's some amount of timer, and there's uh, times in the game where you can flip the timer to the other side, and during that time you can talk. So there's some periods where you can talk in the middle, but like many real-time cooperative games, a little stressful, but really fun. That actually sounds cool. Yeah, definitely recommend it. Charles, did you have any other games before we wrap up? No, Ben hijacked my time today. So. Sorry. <laughs> or wait, I reclaim my time today. <laughs> I reclaim my time <laughs> for next week, though. We'll move into yeah, a different yeah. episode. Uh, but anyways, in the meantime, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, we're on YouTube and Twitter, at Eternally Bored, and our website is... www.eternallyboard.com. Until, Until next, next time, time, we're Eternally, eternally bored, bored, so you, you don't, don't have, have to be. be. Thanks for having me.